I think we should just start this episode off acknowledging your uh, shirt. Yeah, so Jen. <laughs> That's a great let's shirt. Let's talk about sin. Yes. It's uh, everyone's favorite it. topic. So I felt like if we're going to deal with that, we needed appropriate attire. So <laughs> what says sin like bright pink flamingo shirt? So. <laughs> well, <laughs> there are several words for sin used in scripture. There are, yeah. Which can be, I guess, confusing, but... I know you'll break it down so we can just yeah i think i think one of the things i've realized is sin has become one of those junk drawer words in a lot of ways uh where it's almost lost a sense of meaning within our culture and sometimes when we even talk about it we we kind of use it in all sorts of different ways but i'm not sure if we always understand what do we actually mean by that word and how do we actually understand it and part of the reason i think it's really important is because sin is one of the major things that the bible points towards as a core problem of our humanity and so we recognize so so if we don't understand what it is then are we really going to understand how we find the remedy for it you know i was reminded of this uh, a couple years ago i was having a medical issue. I'll spare our viewers the details, but I went to see a doctor and the doctor, after running some tests, essentially looked at me and said, "Uh, I I don't think this is that big a deal. Um, Just, you know, here's some kind of over the counter prescription, deal with it. It it should kind of deal with itself on its own. Well, the problem was it didn't deal with itself on its own. And several years later, I had to go back to another doctor and I ended up having to have surgery Uh, to remedy what the actual issue is. And I learned through that, that if you misdiagnose the problem, the remedy that you will look for often will become ineffective. And I think it's that same reality when we deal with the issue of sin. If we don't understand what we're actually talking about, then are we going to look for the right remedy for what we would say is our core problem as human beings? So, When we look at scripture, I think it's important for us to talk about sin in a couple different lenses. One is, what actually is it? What what is sin? Well, like you said, Jen, the Bible actually uses several different words for sin. And there's kind of three major concepts and words that bubble up out of the Old Testament that then get also translated into the language of the New Testament. The first word that the Bible often uses for sin is what we translate in the English. Uh, the word is transgression. The Hebrew word is the word uh, pasha. And pasha is actually describes the idea of violating a relationship of trust. So if two countries, for instance, were in a treaty and one broke that treaty, that would be pasha. It's relationship violating rebellion. That is one of the key concepts and realities of sin. So when the Bible talks about sin, it's the reality that because God created us, we were created intimately for a relationship with him. But transgression is when we violate, we rebel against that reality and say, I don't need to follow your ways, God. I can do my own thing. It's almost like when a kid comes to a parent and says, I don't have to listen to you. We would recognize that's actually a violation of the parent-kid relationship, right? Because parents are the authority over their kids to essentially for a kid to tell you, I don't need to listen to you, violates the very trust at the heart of the relationship. That's the idea of pasha. The second word that the Bible uses of sin is the Hebrew word avon, which we often translate as iniquity. And Avon carries an interesting connotation. It comes actually out of the word, the root word for bent or crooked. It's the idea of something being twisted or distorted or perverted. But it also carries then the idea of the guilt or punishment that results from that perversion. Meaning God has a certain way things are supposed to be. When we violate that, when we pervert it or distort it, when there's crookedness involved, that brings upon us both a guilt and a judgment or a punishment because of that. Finally, the last word that the Bible uses for sin is the word, and it's the most common, kata. And kata is the idea of missing the mark or missing the goal. 
right? It's the idea that God created, again, the world to be a certain way. And just like you would shoot an arrow at a target, when we miss that way, we kata, we sin, or we actually end up offending the way in which God created the world. So when we step back and we look at sin as a whole, one of the things we recognize is that all of this language is in relationship to both God as creator and in his ordering of creation. That sin ultimately is a rebellion against God. It's a distrust and a pushing away of his authority and then an acting in ways that are contrary to how he actually created the world. So if I were to give you a good definition of sin, I would adapt it actually from one of my favorite books on the subject, which is called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, A Breviary of Sin by uh, Cornelius Plantinga, who's a professor or was a a Calvin Seminary for, for many years. This is a great book, and I adapted my definition from him, kind of integrating these ideas of what the Hebrew scriptures point us towards. And I would say that sin is any act, meaning thought, desire, emotion, word, or deed, or its absence that rebels against God's authority by perverting his world and destroying shalom. Now that word shalom is the Hebrew word harmony. It's it's the idea of the way things are actually supposed to be, the way God made. So that's what sin is. No, notice, it's not just what we do, but it's also what we fail to do in response to God's authority, who he is as creator and king over all. And it works in a way that actually destroys the very thing that God created to be good. So when Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's what he's talking about. He means every single one of us have rejected God's authority and we've brought brokenness, sin, distortion, perversion, offenses into God's world and destroyed things from the way that they should be. And because of that, all of us are marked by sin. The reality of sin is not only what it is, but also what it means. In Psalm 51, David is lamenting the reality of his sin. And he uses all of this language in asking God to forgive him for his offense, ultimately, which was his rape of Bathsheba and the murdering and a plot to murder her husband, which is a horrible reality. And we don't have time to dig into all that background today, but David's lamenting that before God and asking for forgiveness. He uses all of this language, this reality that we've rebelled against God, that we are crooked, that we've offended him and destroyed his good world and shalom. But in the verses three through six, David gets at the heart of not only what sin is, but what it means. And what he notes there is that the reality of sin means that our lives are plagued with guilt and shame. He says that this reality of his transgressions, he always is conscious of, and that the reality of his sin, his chata is always before him, that his life is marked. And we all have a sense of that. We all have a sense of guilt and shame. It's one of the unspoken realities of humanity is that at the core of our being, we feel this sense that we've not only done wrong, but that we are wrong and we're searching for that remedy. But David recognizes in that that the core problem of sin is ultimately our rebellion against God. He says in that statement, against you and you only have I sinned. All the brokenness that overflows in the world ultimately comes because of our rebellion against God from turning from him and seeking our own way. Every area that we see of injustice and unrighteousness in our lives and in our world ultimately come out of our core human problem, which is our rebellion against our creator. And finally, David recognizes that even from the moment of our existence, we are marked by this reality. He says in verse 5, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He looks all the way back to his very entrance into existence and note that sin was present there. So when we look at all of this reality of what sin is and ultimately what sin means for us, what we realize is we don't have a remedy within ourselves. 
The results of sin in scripture are clear. The wages of sin is death. It's a separation from God, both beginning in this life and ultimately carrying on into eternity if God doesn't do something about it. But the good news of the gospel is that God actually provides a remedy for our sin, that Jesus was sent to deal with our sin. Hebrews chapter 9 gives us one of the best understandings of how God actually deals with our sin problem. There, the author writes and says in Hebrews 9, starting in verse 24, for Christ entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The truth, we say, is yes, sin is a major problem. It destroys God's world. It cuts us off from him. It separates us. It's multifaceted in all its brokenness and reality. But the good news is God sent Jesus as a sacrifice for sins. And on the cross, he took that reality to bear. He ultimately died in our place so that God could remove our sin. This is why David in Psalm 103 elsewhere would say, as far as the east is from the west, so you remove our sin from us. Because of Jesus, we actually have a remedy for sin. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more of an understanding of what sin is, but also how God provides the answer for our sin in the person of Jesus. If you would like to learn more about that, we would love to continue this conversation. You can either contact us through our website or leave a comment below, and we'd love to help you know how God remedies our sin problem by putting our faith in Jesus. Thanks. Thank you for watching Everyday Theology. If you want more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.